Welcome to Passion Church. For more information about Passion Church, please visit us online at www.passionchurch.tv. Now let's join the service already in progress. So it is without a doubt a Hall of Fame worthy playground game. It was a perennial favorite. In fact, it was one of my favorites. Now, you need to understand what I look like in grade school. I mean, I hit high school at 75 pounds as a freshman. So even in elementary school, grade school, I wasn't very big. But the reason I loved this game was because even though I was so small in stature, over a very short distance of space, I could pick up a lot of speed. And so I loved this game because it kind of equaled everything as we would lock arms or lock hands with our classmates and we would play this incredible game called Red Rover, Red Rover. Now, I I don't want to make the assumption that you are a a Red Rover aficionado as much as I am. I don't want to make any assumptions that you are an expert at Red Rover, Red Rover. So let me just remind you of the basics by uh, by, uh, demonstrating. Uh, So Lane, Tari, y'all come here. Come on, Josh, you too. Y'all go, yeah, Tari, come on, bro. Yeah, yeah, right here, right here. I want y'all to stand right there. That's one team. Come on, Drew, you and James and Travis. Come on, Travis. This is my, this is my, now listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna warn y'all right now. This is, this is like a walkthrough at football practice. We don't go full speed here, all right? I'll let y'all settle this in the grass lot after church. So, the, all right, so. So, so, so. <laughs> yeah, so this is what would happen. Do you remember? Two teams would face off in the playground and they would lock hands, not arms, hands, hands, right? Hands only. And then they would, they would uh, this team would decide that they had picked out the weak link to call over and we would, <laughs> we would start it like this. This is how it would go. Uh, y'all, fo- y'all follow my lead now. Red Rover, Red Rover. Let Slowpoke Tari come over, all right? So Tari would pick up an amazing amount of speed. And, and then he would come here and he would, he, would, he would try to gather all of his speed and all of his strength. Remember, he does have an existing shoulder injury, so you may have picked wrong. And he would try to break through. So here's what would happen. If he was unable to break through, right? So he's unable to break through, then he had to stay on this team, right? However, come back. Today we believe in that, the anointing of... Uh, what was, the, what was the guys that was so fast in the Old Testament? Um, oh, my, I can't remember. He, he could, who? Come on, Bible. No, he was fast, but that's not her. Anyway, never mind. Different story, different sermon, all right? He would pick up all this amazing amount of speed, and he would break through these arms, right? And when he broke through, he had the option to pick one of the guys that he'd broken through and take them back to his team, all right? Y'all got it? So the, so the idea was that we would cause one team to run out of players, and the team that had the most players would win, all right? So they will be out in the back lot after church demonstrating this at full speed. All right, y'all can, thank you guys. So, so, so this, is, this is what happened. The, as I grew older, I learned to appreciate the strategy involved in Red Rover because there was some choices you had to make. When you were chosen, you had to make, the, make a decision really quick. Where is the weak link? that I can break through, right? Uh, If you're choosing, you had to make some strategic choices about who to call who you didn't think would have enough strength and speed to break through, correct? So so honestly, as I got older, I learned to hate this game um, because uh, as we got older, people got stronger and faster. And if you were on the receiving end of the guy trying to break, or the girl, because we had some girls that could lay it on you now, they they would pick up and they'd come, boom, and they'd break your arms. And so we quit playing this at a certain age, right? So, so so, So all of that to say this, I set you up. The single most impacting force in our life is relationships. Relationship management is, in fact, life management. 
This is true spiritually on, uh, on, on the other side of eternity. When you come into relationship with Jesus like Pastor Drew just gave you the opportunity to do, when you make that decision to follow Christ, it impacts your eternity, right? But what we forget is that on this side of eternity, it is relationships that set the course and the trajectory of our life. It determines the quality of our life. That's why we can make this statement. If you show me your friends, I will show you your future. Right? You've heard that statement before. And so they're important. And I think the issue is, is that we have a lot of folks that come to church to learn how to do spiritual warfare, to fight off demons, break bondages, but they never come to church and learn how to manage relationships. And so, so you win spiritually, but you lose relationally. And the dilemma there is this. Jesus came not only to show us how to win spiritually, Jesus also modeled for us on more than one occasion. We're going to look at one occasion this morning. But on more than one occasion, Jesus modeled for us how to manage our relationships properly so that we could win. And so we got to figure out how to win. So let me tell you that in order to win in relationships, you must become a Red Rover expert. Because the entire premise of Red Rover is simply this. You keep people out or you let people in. And so we got to learn to let the right people break in and we got to learn to keep the wrong people out. And so I want us to examine this encounter that Jesus has in the New Testament. You can turn there if you want to. John chapter 9, it illustrates for us one, one example of how he teaches us this, how to become Red Rover champions. Here it is, John chapter 9. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. Now, I'm going to stop right there. Didn't plan on saying this. One version says that Jesus said this happened so the glory of God could be revealed. We just saying, show me your glory. Some of us are trying to, this is free. This is not, you're getting this free, all right? Some of us are trying to pray our way out of stuff. And we're saying, God, you got to get me out of this because this is so bad. And God is looking at you in return going, dude, you're praying more right now than you've ever prayed in your life life. I'm not going to let you out of this. This hurts more than anything I can bear, Jesus. And God's saying, listen, all I'm trying to do is show you the glory. You're more anointed right now than you've ever been in your life. And I'm not going to let you out because what I'm doing is I'm allowing the glory of God to be revealed in your situation. That's free, 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 free. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the task assigned to us by the one who sent us. The night is coming and then no one can work. But while I'm here in the world, I'm the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground. Some of y'all want to be healed. You just don't want to be healed the way Jesus wants to heal you. Then he spit. Y'all, I ain't illustrating. I don't want to make the, 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 the Facebook feed. Then, then he spit on the ground. He made mud with, with saliva and he spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. And he told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means sent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. Verse 13. Then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. Then they cursed him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we didn't even know where, we don't even know where this man comes from. Verse uh, 38 or 28. With that, very, why that's very strange, the man, they begin to ask him some questions. His, this is his response. Why that's very strange, the man replied, he healed my eyes and yet you don't know where he came from? Listen to this. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he's ready to hear those who worship him or, and do his will. Listen to this statement. Ever since the world began, no one has ever been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. You were born a total sinner, they answered. Are you trying to teach us? Listen to this. And they threw him out of Passion Church. Come on, read it in our context. So, so here's what happens. 
The disciples are walking down the road with Jesus. They run into a blind man. They ask Jesus, is this his fault or his parents' fault? Jesus said, neither. I'm going to show you the glory of God. He spits in the mud, rubs it on his eyes, sends him to a pool, heals him. The people that now find a guy that they're accustomed to seeing blind, see what I did there? Accustomed to seeing blind, drag him to the religious leaders because Jesus healed him on a Sabbath. And the religious leaders cannot get this guy to agree with them that it's wrong for him to get healed on Sabbath because he's just glad to be healed. And so the response is, is they throw him out of the temple. I want to point out a couple of things of note from this account, and then I want to give you a couple of Red Rover pointers. Number one, I want you to notice that this man is identified by John as a blind man. He's been blind since birth. I also want you to notice that the man himself regurgitates the, what his, the, the believed order of the day. He regurgitates the position of the day that ever since the, ever since the beginning of the world, no one, nobody, has been able to open the, the eyes of someone born blind. So since this was the belief of his surrounding community, and since this was the belief of the religious leaders of the day, something had happened in this man's heart. Now, this is a testimony after the fact he's been healed, but read into it what he's saying. He's come to the conclusion at some point in his life that this, what just happened to him, was impossible. Right, so, 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 so he has become settled, he's become set in, he's become comfortable, he's become accustomed to and doomed to a sightless life. Everyone around him has apparently concluded that blindness since birth is the final prognosis. So in other words, no one has ever, listen, here comes Red Rover, no one has ever been allowed to break through the blindness, blindness and the sightlessness of his life. There was no one in his life who could crash through all of these beliefs before Jesus shows up and give him any hope. Nobody. So, the, so now I, I, wanna, I want you to remember, I told you that the premise of winning and becoming an expert of Red Rover is this. You've got to know to who to let in and who to keep out. And so from this account, I need to ask you the million dollar question. And as I ask you this question and we begin to talk about some stuff, I want you to do two things. One, I want you to evaluate the people around you. And I want you to pick up a mirror and evaluate yourself and determine where you fall. Am I somebody that people should let into their lives or am I somebody that people should resist? Because here's the million dollar question. Here it is. How do we know who to let in and who to keep out? Oh, it's going to, okay. Y'all were with me while we were playing games, but now we're getting down to real work. This is Red Rover graduate level. Master's degree. You're getting ready to get a doctorate in Red Rover. Here it is. You got to let people in that see you better than you see you. From this account, what we discover and learn is that we absolutely, why, why am I on this? I've been on this for weeks. I don't know. We've got to allow people in that make us hungry. The blind man was comfortable with blind until Jesus shows up and reveals to him that you don't always have to be blind. You can be better than you are right now. So, 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 so we need someone who can see our blindness and make us recognize that it, that it can and should be different than it is right now. I point that out to some of us because some of us won't let people into our lives that call us to be better versions of ourselves than we are right now because we come to the conclusion that it will never be any different and I'll never change and I'll never be free. You need some folks, you need some individuals in your life that can roll up 
on you and see you better than you see you. Yeah, so, so we need people that bring clarity. They bring sight. They bring knowledge. They refuse to allow you to settle for blindness in any area of your life because the truth is, is that too many of us have become way too comfortable in our own sickness. Yeah, yeah, we, we become comfortable in our own issues. Everybody, all of us are blind at some place in our life. That's why they call it blind spots. You don't recognize it. Some of y'all sitting in here right now blind in some, of your, in some area of your life and you can't even recognize it. That's why you've got to learn to be an expert at Red Rover and let the right people in that can spot your, your, your issue because, because we become convinced of the finality of our own flaws. And you need somebody that will walk right up into your life and break in and say, you, you, you've got a flaw, but it's not fatal and it's not final. There's somebody that I know that I can bring into your life to help you break this cycle in your life. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we need someone to help us see that I can be different than I am right now. Someone to speak to us and spark a desire for sight and health and breakthrough. Uh, th th these folks help you see you better than you are right now, so they spark desire in you t t for more. They're, they're sent by Jesus to break through your comfort zones and your satisfied places and they call us to be a better version of us. So some of us are way too comfortable with our bad choices, with bad decisions, with bad attitudes, with bad habits, with bad relationships, with bad behavior, and we become so comfortable in it that our only, we've been blind since birth. We've always been like that. In fact, daddy was like that, and daddy's dad was like that, and daddy's dad's dad was like that, and we just walk through life blind, bumping into the same issue, same situation, and we need somebody to, to show up in our life. Jesus sent that helps us see us better. We, we, we've come to this place where we've got to come to this place where we say this, Red Rover, Red Rover, send a truth teller over. Somebody that won't sugarcoat it, somebody that won't make it better than it is. It'll be okay, baby. You've always been like this. It'll, it, you may, you're just going to have to learn to deal with that. The devil is a liar. Why? Jesus didn't leave sick people sick. Jesus didn't leave blind people blind. Jesus didn't leave dead people dead. Jesus didn't leave broken people broken. He would show us a better version of us. And we need people like that. Here's the problem. Too often we ask for God to send someone to help us with our issues and we ask for them and then when they arrive, because we're not Red Rover experts, we resist. They show up telling us the truth, but we don't like the truth. You can't, I can't handle the, okay, let's make it personal. Not you can't handle the truth. There's a lot of times I can't handle the truth. And we've prayed and asked God to help us go free. He sends us somebody to speak truth to us and we will fight them tooth and nail. I don't, I didn't ask you, don't you tell me, you can't tell me what to do. Well, if you'd let them tell you what to do, you'd go free. So God sends folks who have insight, they have correction, they have discipline, they have grace, they have wisdom, but too many of us keep rebutting them, rejecting them, and refusing them to let them, let them break into our world, but they were sent to be in your camp, but they cannot be in your camp if you won't let them in your camp. And so I'm just trying to help you play Red Rover better. You gotta let folks into your life that see you as a better version of you than you are right now. Number two, we got to let people in who do more than just identify an issue. We got to let people in who can fix the issue. I want you to go back. Oh, I'm helping somebody right now because some of y'all got a lot of people in your life that can spot some stuff. They just can't fix nothing. Some, so you got to go back to the account and you got to go read. And what you discover is that the disciples and all of their religious leaders of the day were experts at pointing out what was wrong. 
Go back. I'm just, I'm just, I, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm just telling you Bible. Go back and read the account. The disciples are walking down the road saying, ooh, he's blind. He's got to have sin in his life or his parents have got to sin because he's been blind. John says he's been blind since birth. They drag him to the religious leader or talk to the religious leaders and they go, yep, he's got it. He's either sinned or his parents sinned. He's got issues in his life. He's blind. Experts at pointing out what's wrong can't do squat to fix it. But Jesus, Jesus has this ability to not only identify what is wrong in us, he has the ability and the desire and all of the anointing necessary to what, because the Bible says he said about himself that I've been sent to give sight to the blind. So he walks in and not only can he identify what's wrong, he has the ability to fix what's wrong. Some of y'all are, your life is flooded with people who are experts at telling you what's wrong. They just aren't able to do anything about it. And I'm telling you, you need to become a Red Rover expert and when they approach your life and then they keep running into your life saying this is wrong and that's wrong and this is wrong and you turn around and go, what can I do? And they go, I don't know. Got no solution for you. Lock your arms and don't let them in. Here's why. I'm going to prove it to you. Here's why. Too many of us have problem spotters. We need to do this. Red Rover, Red Rover, let problem solvers come over. Here's why. Why would you allow people in your life to talk to you about money? that have no ability to balance their own checkbook. Why would you allow somebody to break into your life to point out all of your financial issues? You don't spend your money right. You don't save your money right. You don't allocate your money right. And they're broke and don't have two cents to rub together because of all the bad decisions they've made. Why don't instead you let somebody roll up into your life that goes, man, you've got serious. I'm not telling you you don't need problem spotters. I'm just saying you need to find some folks that can spot the problem, identify the problem, and then help you fix the problem. Like I see that you're broke and you can't balance your budget and you're making really bad purchase decisions. Let me help you. Let me tell you about the fact that when I begin to tithe and when I begin to surrender my money to God and I went and sat down with the financial planner and he helped me learn how to budget and I, my dad taught me how to, to balance a checkbook. Go find those people. Why would you let people into your life? to give you relationship advice who have never had one healthy relationship in all of their entire life. They're like on their 19th marriage and you want to sit down with them for marriage counseling. Come on. You should let those people in. You should let people in that have successful relationships proven. Same thing is true spiritually. Why would you want to let people into your life to spot all your problems spiritually but they never model Never model for them, for you or anybody else, actual growth in their own life. It is quiet up in here. So y'all don't know, y'all don't know, y'all don't know the fight that I have to put up for this church all the time. Let me just get real personal about our church. This is true for every church. There are a lot of self-appointed church experts running around that can point all the problems and tell you what, you, what they think you should do. The only problem is they've never pastored in their entire life. They've never had, if they did, they didn't have a church where two people were, gay. nobody wanted to be under their leadership and they can, they, we put them up as experts. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. I'm talking to you about finding practitioners, people that actually practice what they're trying to help you with. I'm not telling you to live your life with nobody prophetically speaking in your life going, that's wrong, this is wrong, that's wrong. What I am telling you is you better have somebody in your life that when you see the problems and the problems are identified, that they can step up beside you and help you walk through them. If that does not happen, you'll stay not only blind, you'll stay hopeless. Because they'll tell you what's wrong and you won't have a clue how to fix them. Okay, three. Keep people out of your life who prefer your blindness more than they prefer your sight. I want you to go back and realize that the religious leaders threw this man out of the temple after he had been healed. They didn't seem to have a big problem with him begging on the side of the road in his blindness. But the moment he gets healed, 
they pick him up and physically throw him out of church. Yeah, so, 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 they, so, so they were good with him as long as he was blind. They didn't bother him as long as he was disabled. Now he's miraculously healed and they never celebrate his sight. I can't find one place where they celebrate the fact that he is now sighted. Instead, they throw him out when he was whole. A good indication of whether someone should be allowed access into your life is how they handle your growth. How do they handle your success? How do they handle your improvement? A lot of times we keep people in our lives who attack us when we're getting better. They prefer the previous version of ourselves because in our bondage they were comfortable. Misery loves company, so as long as I'm addicted to drugs, they're satisfied with me because they're addicted to drugs. And if I start getting healthy, it will expose the fact that they're not as healthy as they've been playing like they were. If I'm broken spiritually, you're all right with me until I start getting over what you're still hung up on. And all of a sudden, you don't like me very much now, and you don't want to spend any time, and you begin to accuse me because you can't handle the fact that I'm getting better. Too many people are comfortable with us when we're messed up. They don't know what to do with us when we're put together. Those folks, you gotta keep those folks out. Why? I'm helping you be a Red Rover expert. Why do you gotta keep those folks out? Because they'll drag you back to blindness. If you let them in your life and they're more comfortable with your brokenness, your bondage, your, your struggles, your issues, if you allow them into your life, they, because they're not comfortable with your improvement, they will drag you back to the level of comfort zone that they had with you previously and you will go from free back to bound. Last but not least, the bottom line is that we've got to learn to set boundaries. This is all about boundaries. To win, here it is, to win, you cannot let everyone in. Equal love, not equal access. I'm going to say it one more time because I could help somebody right now. You owe everybody the same amount of love. You don't owe everybody the same amount of access. So to win, you can't let everybody in. But let me help somebody in the room this morning. To win, you can't keep everybody out either. Some of us don't win because we let everybody in. Some of you are losing today because you have kept everybody out. And so you have to be able to determine who should be granted access and those who should be denied based on what they do when they arrive to get in. So let me help you. Here it is. Do they bring your expectation and your hunger levels up? If the answer is yes, let them in. Okay. Do, do, do they help me desire more? Let them in. Do, do they just point out what's wrong and then they hit the road? Can't help me a bit. Lock your arms. Don't let them in. Keep them out. Instead, when they come to you and say, man, I see this issue in your life and I've been through this and I know how to get us out of this. Let them in. Yeah. Yeah. Do they point out what is wrong and have the answers? Then let them in. Are they more comfortable with your messed up and with you messed up and broken than they are when you're making improvements? Then keep them out. Why? Because your freedom is at stake. So to become a Red Rover expert, you've got to understand the stakes that are at risk here. I have got to figure out who I should say, come on into my life. And I got to figure out who to say, uh-uh, I love you, but you ain't getting access up in here. You know why? Because your sight's worth it. Your freedom is worth it. Your destiny, your purpose is worth it. Jesus is very vividly teaching us this fact right here, and then I'm going to get out of your way. He's teaching us that well, relation, relationships will be the reason we either leave, live in purpose or live in pain. And that's all determined by who you let in and who you keep out. You must become a Red Rover 
expert. And so what I'm asking you to do is to do more than just evaluate the people around you. I need you to evaluate you. Am I the type of person that that people should let into their life? Or should they be denying me access? That's the first question because you always got to start with you. But I also need you to evaluate the relationships around you because some of you got some people in your life that really you should just lock hands and say, I can't let you in. I love you, but I can't let you in. And some of you are fighting people off that are God sent. You've been praying a long time for God to send somebody to you, and he did. Some of you are sitting next to him right now. You won't take their calls. You won't share your heart. You won't let them speak truth into your life because you don't know how to play this game. I'm gonna pray for you this morning, and then I'm gonna ask you to be very honest and open, not with me, with you and with God. Would you just bow your heads right where you are, Father? I pray in Jesus' name. It's been a privilege to have you join us for this time of ministry. To find more Passion Church resources or to make a donation online, visit www.passionchurch.tv. Remember, you can't live without passion.